surprisingly, Mao went into um, Africa really early in his administration. They've been in Africa for quite a while. They built the Tazara line in the 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's been half a century for sure that they've been there. So we kind of think that a lot of these contracts in the Belt and Road Initiative, and now China has 140 countries signed on with the Belt and Road Initiative, 140 of them. This isn't this isn't one, you know, this isn't like a couple of countries. There are 140. And so in Africa, China needs uh, resources. They need um, minerals. They need energy. They don't have these natural resources. And so the best thing to do was to go into countries that um, could provide them with the minerals that they needed in order to produce or manufacture products. And they're doing it more so now um, than before. And it's really, it's not just about the minerals. It's, you know, if ever you need proof that China is trying to create an alternative world order to compete against the United States, Belt and Road, 140 countries, they're creating this alternate sphere of influence uh, that also ties into Chinese military expansion. Uh, we'll get into some of the digital Belt and Road stuff as well, but also about, you know, uh, uh, surrounding India, for instance, and eliminating competition to the Chinese Communist Party world order. Certainly the string of pearls, you know, the Indo-Pacific is important. But I think another thing that we don't think about quite often is how China is in, inserting people into United Nations organizations. You know, they have a member on the Human Rights Committee, the Human Rights Committee. Can you believe it? Um, and how they're doing that is if they have a country that can't pay their debt, they owe China. And so it's very easy. You are going to vote with us, um, tell the United Nations that we should have um, China, China or a proxy serve on these committees so that we can have China friendly policies. Um, and I think we're going to see more of the United Nations turn into a, a China friendly organization. Yeah, I mean, I would say saw that with the WHO. I would say you definitely had that before Belt and Road, but it, it's definitely increased more and more. Not just in the U UN, but also you know ASEAN, the EU, all of these international bodies. And what's interesting too is you don't even have to be a country that's in debt to China, as long as you've signed a Belt and Road Agreement with them. There's a certain expectation that you're going to align with China's politics, right? Otherwise, they'll be unhappy with you. You know, you're not cooperating. I think, you know, well, 140 countries, like that's more than two thirds of the countries, right? There's about 200, depending on what you call a country, right? And so essentially China now has influence over more than two thirds of the world's votes in the, the world's only like important governing body. That's terrifying. It's terrifying. I think everybody should be terrified. And yet I don't think pe the media or people really are aware that that there's this tidal wave and it's you can see the tidal wave and it's right over top of us. But the title, the tidal wave is promising win win mutual cooperation. <laughs> yeah. Well, why do you think people are ignoring this? Uh. China took the opportunity for uh, through the pandemic to engage with countries all over the world. And nobody nobody is thinking about that because we're all thinking about our health, our fate, our um, vaccines, whether we're going to go to school. The changes in political environment um, are taking precedent in the media rather than um, really guys, you should worry about this because it's not a person who's an alarmist. I'm not an alarmist. I'm just a regular citizen. I'm just a regular citizen. I live in Southern California. Um, I am just awakened to um, information that I think people should know.